Well, uh, I hope everyone can uh, hear me as I uh, talk like this. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really uh, sad not to have the chance to be there because the uh, agenda looks are really uh, fascinating, and so I appreciate being involved. And I'm also um, grateful for everyone there tolerating what I know is sometimes the rather awkward uh, uh, practicalities of, of, of listening through Skype. So I hope this works, and thank you for your patience. Thank you also for tolerating this extraordinarily large picture of me at the front, which I find quite disturbing. Anyway, um, I'm going to uh, pick up on some themes from the manifesto that the Steps Centre coordinated, and I believe um, was discussed yesterday, along with other manifestos. The themes of direction, distribution, and diversity. And in particular, how these relate to the field, uh, crucial field of low carbon innovation. And I'm going to do a little uh, bumps to uh, inform my colleague Adrian Ely there to uh, move the slide on to the next one. Now, one uh, really striking feature of these debates as they play out in different ways around the world is that we face an, an, an incredible variety of different possible innovation pathways to realize low carbon energy futures. And here I'm using the term innovation in the broader sense that I know the conference has been discussing, including technology, institutions, practices, and so forth. So at the highest level, for instance, we have options around the restructuring of demand in profound ways, behavior change in end use, greater technical efficiency, uh, service reform, institutional reform, new renewable energy supply sources, options for capturing carbon and uh, sequestering it back in uh, geological formations, or, of course, different kinds of new. And then um, within each one of those, we, we face a further array of choices, quite profoundly contrasting in their institutional and technological implications. So, for instance, among renewable energies, we have choices between centralized, continent-spanning infrastructures, or the wide-scale use of marine resources and, um, and area, radical changes in land use, or distributed generation integrated into, into structures in our cities and uh, rural communities. And then even within each of those, we face a further series of very diverse technological configurations that can help deliver them. Uh, so small, large hydro, wave power, um, tidal stream, onshore, offshore wind, high-altitude kites, photovoltaics, biomass of many different kinds, geothermal, etc., etc. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that each of these options is physically feasible, technically uh, uh, possible, economically viable, given the right path-dependent development pathways, but we cannot realize all these options fully together, especially in a world of globalization and standardization. We will and have to make choices between them. Some kind of mix is possible, but we can't optimize the mix for all the possible uh, configurations. Now, this central dilemma in sustainable energy strategies is missed in high-level policy making, as it is in other sectors. So, mainstream policy takes the eyeing nature of the sustainability transition as a given. So, we hear about sound scientific research, evidence-based policy, pro-innovation strategies, optimizing technologies, achieve, trying to achieve market equilibrium, as if there's one kind of direction in which uh, low-carbon innovation is going to be taking us, and we simply have to try and realize that in as effective and efficient a fashion as possible. In other words, we get a kind of rhetoric of, and I think this is true in many different political contexts, of no alternatives, as if it's a technical managerial matter of delivering this so supposedly singular sustainability transition. So you see the face there, if we're on the right slide, of uh, Professor Sir David King, the former British chief scientist, who was very keen on this kind of no alternative language around low carbon energy strategies. We have no alternative to nuclear power, he would say repeatedly. But the point isn't specific to nuclear. It tends, whatever uh, the, the, the technological focus, there tends to be this rather managerial uh, focus. So, what can we say about this? Well, if you're seeing my glorious rotating slide there, um, 
the one common picture that arises in all the different disciplines, focusing on the study of technology and society and the dynamics of innovation, is the basic picture is the other way around. It's not a matter of converging uh, from different possibilities to a single inevitable direction. It's the other way around, that each technological starting point yields diverging possible future innovation pathways. So the best, what constitutes the best of these pathways is not about some kind of innovation, but at least as importantly, about social and, crucially, political choices. And this arises in the sociology, the economics, the history, the philosophy of technological change equally. So just to say a few words, which I'm sure people there are very familiar with the basic mechanisms I'm thinking of here, there are a variety of processes, social, economic, institutional, uh, power-laden processes that close down the direction of pro progress in any given area, especially in an area such as the ones we're considering here. So our imaginations about the future, the expectations that they influence financial markets, for instance, is one example of a process of closure. Another one is what's referred to in the literature as political autonomy and entrapment, the deliberate exercise of power to configure regulatory and governance systems to favor particular options, such as the urban automobile or the light water reactor, as we've seen it in, in, in this sector. Then there are processes of more, more uh, blind, emergent processes of historical momentum and path dependency, like the QWERTY keyboard or the uh, alternating current electricity grid or narrow gauge railways that just become uh, uh, established and are very difficult to move. And then even in the most competitive marketplaces, uh, like for instance in consumer products, we have uh, the lock-in of particular economic trajectories, Windows software, um, uh, certain kinds of formats for videos and computing and so forth. So we see a variety of mechanisms that close down the possibilities, close down the direction of progress. And yet it remains the case, even in an area like low carbon energy, which is prospectively looking forward with all these different choices, that the discussion tends, tends to take place in high level policy making as if innovation in this area is homogeneous. There's no great room for distinctions, uh, no al real alternative pathways highlighted, therefore no room really for politics and discussions about social choice. So the kind of debate that unfolds then is tends to be about yes or no, how much, how fast, how efficient, who's leading with respect to some presumed inevitable direction for progress, depending on who's emphasizing it. For instance, I mentioned in the UK with Sir David King, it happens to be nuclear power. And what's missed out, what's seriously neglected, are questions over which way, what alternatives, says who, and why. And this is crucial in general about innovation, but it's crucial within an area like low carbon innovation, where, as I've quickly rehearsed at the beginning, we have so many different choices. Now, the second D, then, beyond direction, is distribution, because we're very familiar with distributional questions around the kind of trickle down of benefits, uh, the reduction of risks from presumed singular technological paths. But the implications of what I've just outlined are far more profound, because it's not just how we distribute benefits from a particular path that is at stake, it's the actual configurations of the paths themselves. So the existing pathways that are favored by these dynamics I mentioned are those um, preferred by incumbent interests, uh, optimizing for private profit, often military interests, which constitutes a very large fraction of the world's innovation systems as a whole, have a, have a profound influence, and nuclear is not irrelevant there, intellectual property, the demand exercised by rich consumers rather than poor consumers, and the ability to um, obtain rent on supply chains, for instance, from fossil fuels. These favor particular pathways rather than others. And so when we see that there is this scope for different directions of change, even within a frame like low carbon innovation, we see the profound importance of the distributional issues, not just from trickle down, but from the um, uh, configurations themselves. And so the innovation paths favored by and most in the interests of the more marginal groups and these powerful groups tend to be the most excluded. Cooperative arrangements, civil society innovation, so-called bottom of the pyramid kind of products and, and options, community innovation more generally. So this kind of one track race that we see in general, but in particular around low carbon innovation as well, 
undermine the least powerful. Uh, they systematically marginalize those interests most strongly, and they deny the opportunity for democratic challenge of the course of events as they unfold, of, of asserting some kind of accountability, some scope for criticism and dissent and discussion of alternatives, are all suppressed by the very language we use um, in these matters. So now, to turn to the final D of the three Ds, uh, direction, distribution, and now diversity, suddenly what comes into focus is not that we need to think about uh, only which one of many directions should we pursue, but we should start thinking about the dynamics of diversity between them. How do different pathways fit together? Which ones work together well? Which ones obstruct each other? And at the Step Center, we've done a bit of work, so have many others, trying to unpick this property of diversity, which gets systematically sidelined by this one track of obsession with uh, innovation as if it was undifferentiated. Variety, how many different options are in the mix, balance, to what extent are we um, uh, proportionate in our reliance on different options, and crucially, disparity. How different are these different options from each other? Um, these are kind of just uh, uh, sort of intrinsic qualities. We've developed some indices, but that's uh, not of particular interest of, um, what you can, that can be used operationally. The crucial point is, and here in this chart you probably can't see the small writing in the bottom left, but what that shows is just different energy options differ from one another to differing degrees. So different fossil fuels, we may count them as coal, oil, gas, uh, with, uh, for instance, carbon capture, but they differ from one another far less radically than fossil fuels do from nuclear or than fossil fuels and nuclear together do from many of the renewables. And in fact, this category, renewable energy, is itself more diverse than any of the existing uh, supply portfolios, including as it does solid state technologies like photovoltaics or different institutional arrangements. And that as we think of supply, uh, demand side and service reform, then we see this diversity increases in social institutional terms. So unless we think about the, the qualitative diversity of different kinds of options, we don't really get to grips with this crucial property of different pathways, how they fit together, and how they complement one another, how they hedge against uncertainty, because we don't actually understand what the future holds for them, and how they accommodate different plural interests and values in society. So basically, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that there is a lot of scope for thinking about how different energy technologies, low-carbon energy technologies, fit together in mixes. Um, the chart shows in the bottom right here a, a study that we've done in a European context, but it just shows how you can think systematically about on the left-hand side of the, of the colourful chart, maximising the performance of the mix according to any particular view, whether it be environmental or economic or progressive social reform, but then moving along towards the right-hand side of the chart, maximising the diversity of the different options and how they fit together um, in, in, in mixes in the real world. This doesn't avoid difficult choices about path dependency or making trade-offs. There's a lot of politics in this, and that's what I want to come to in my final slide. So really, what we're talking about here is thinking in low-carbon terms about, energy, about diversity much more explicitly, being open-eyed about the fact that we have different pathways, we can't optimize all, traditional approaches, risk-based approaches focus on a presumed direction, they convey to governance debates about low-carbon energy a very closed down picture, emphasizing particular options as if that was the only alternative, which then reinforces lock-in in the system as a whole, for instance, to nuclear power or to carbon sources. If instead, what we do is we broaden out, be more precautionary in the, the different pathways we consider, the different options, the different issues, the uncertainties, the different interests, highlighting marginal and vulnerable perspectives to get a broader and more diverse picture of different kinds of sustainabilities, different kinds of low-carbon futures, and then pass that on to political debates in a more plural form, to open up real political choices, not just bury it in assessment, and provide platforms for more excluded interests in a political fashion, we might foster a more deliberate and diverse mix of options in that fashion. So we're not short of the technical possibilities, but they're not being fully attended to and realized at the moment because of these processes of closure, which we can do a lot to help open up by the way we think, by the way we appraise energy technologies and talk about them politically. And it's in that way, I would argue, that this kind of 3D agenda helps to reconcile 
what are often apparently contending agendas between scientific rigor, technological feasibility, but on the other hand, democratic accountability and legitimacy by using tools that expose and really be open-eyed about processes of lock-in, processes of power, um, and the different possibilities we have, even within an apparently confined domain like low-carbon energy. So uh, uh, that's your talk about the 3Ds in energy. I hope it uh, made sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for keeping the time.